All right, so we'll um, continue um, in Philippians. So some of the three major themes in the book of Philippians is going to be joy, encouragement, and partnership. Um, so I think every class I like to kind of remind myself about the book of Philippians. I think for me, I am pretty forgetful. So it's just the repetition is what keeps me uh, drill it into my brain. But remember, Philippi is a Roman colony. So it uh, being a Roman colony, the citizens of that colony are basically citizens of Rome. If you're a citizen of Philippi, you're a citizen of Rome. Paul started the work in Philippi 10 years or more prior um, than when he wrote this letter. So he started that work, and we read about that in Acts chapter 16. Ten years later or more, he's now in a Roman uh, jail, uh, home arrest, and he's writing a letter of encouragement back to his brethren. Um, so tonight we're going to start chapter 2, um, and really tonight um, is centered around encouragement and partnership. So as we um, start into chapter 2, um, I think it's helpful for us to rewind a little bit and start at the end of chapter 1. And Mostly it's going to be um, when it's talking about standing firm. So we'll be reading this together tonight. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and this too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer on his behalf, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. So here we are instructed to stand firm in one spirit with one mind, um, together for faith in the gospel. So I guess my first question for the group is, why is unity critical against our opponents? Why is unity critical against our opponents? Why is unity critical against our uh, opponent? So um, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around it, so I'm going to change subjects a little bit. Um, so I want to uh, think of this as if you were a parent, and instead of our opponents, we're thinking about our children. So do you think what I'm about to read, could this be biblical advice from Paul? Parents, stand firm in one spirit with one mind striving together to raise godly children. And in no way be afraid of your children, which will be a sign of destruction for them. Could that be biblical advice, raising children? Parents, stand firm, united, and don't be afraid. So for me, when I was thinking about what Paul is writing to the Philippians, um, stand firm, against, united against your opponents, your unity um, is critical. So from a parent aspect, if parents aren't united, what happens? If parents aren't united when raising their children, what happens? Super fast. Hey, Dad, can I go spend the night? Sure, thanks. Mom already told me no. <laughs> and it's just like kids will find the weakness. Isn't that true? Kids will find the weakness. If you're not united, children will find a way to find the weakness. Um, uh, what else? What, what else about unity is critical um, as a weapon against our opponents? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Yep, strength of numbers, and then just different knowledge, different experiences, and you can tackle different objections um, together. Thank you. Anything else? What is, uh, 
why is unity critical against our opponent? All right. Okay. Thank you. So um, I also want to think about a unified front. So the Romans were usually pretty good at fighting battles. I would, uh, I'm not a huge military man. So, but the little thing that I know about war would be a unified front, to me, is a key to winning a battle. Um, a unified front has no weak spots. A unified front can't really be broken. Uh, a unified front is coordinated. It works together. It can handle attack after attack after attack. Um, but it also, having a unified front, it really requires you to take the interests of the person that's next to you into account. It's going to take you to work together, that their life is just as important as yours. Um, so in the Romans, when they would have their big shields, and if one of them went down, they wouldn't just leave that gap opened up. Everybody would come together to uh, get that bond back, um, back in line. So the unified front is a, um, almost a, a position of strength, um, and it prevents, um, you know, it, it prevents weakness in the system. And as Christians, um, Having that unity amongst ourselves is important, not only for uh, happiness in getting along within the church, but also as a weapon of attack or defense against the enemy. Any other thoughts or ideas or comments? Okay. Um, yep, Heather is saying that it goes into uh, Ecclesiastes. Two are strong, but with the third, it's threefold. I think the idea there is um, like if you have two horses that aren't yoked together, I think it's two horsepower. But then if you yoke them together, it's something like five. Um, not a huge farmer either, so you're just going to have to Google that one. Um, Okay, any other ideas or, or comments or suggestions about why a united front is so important? Okay. Um, so regarding what gospel issues, so if we, if we know that um, unity, um, unity in the church is critical, what gospel issue does Eastland need to hold its nerve and remain unafraid in the face of resistance? What types of um, issues in the community that we face do we need to make sure that we stay unified against and we are unafraid in the face of resistance? Are there any examples that you can think of? of what issues do we need to be united, unified um, and unafraid in the face of resistance. Okay. Yep. Uh, just cultural issues that are going on that are, go against uh, biblical wisdom. Thank you. Yeah. 
because uh, it's, it's hard to stand up against people that have similar beliefs. Um, but yeah, uh, items related to worship. Thank you. Anything else? Any other issues that we face today that we need to uh, be conscious about of making a unified effort to stand against? Okay, so let me, um, I think I heard you. I'm going to replay what I think I heard, and then you correct me if I'm way off. Um, but almost like fighting the lie that uh, there is no one truth. Um, and so it's like the idea out there is however I feel is true, but we can go to Scripture and just say, no, there is one truth, and this is what it is. I'm getting a thumbs up close enough. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. So if we refuse, if we refuse to be intimidated by our opponents, what will be the result? If we refuse to be intimidated by our opponents, what will be the result? You what? We, yeah, we get to suffer. Um, yep, we get to suffer. Uh, what, uh, what about for them? So, yep, so your children, um, if your children see that mom and dad are always unified, what does that cause in them? Conviction? Okay. So to me, it causes, um, there's no hope of winning. Like, in the old days, when mom and dad didn't get along, and mom and dad weren't communicated and weren't united, I could just ask one, ask the other, ask one, ask the other, ask one, ask the other, and I'm just waiting because one day, like, one of them's going to slip and just say yes when I knew all along they aren't communicating. Um, but if I know that they're 100% united, there's just no hope for me winning um, because there is no weak spots. Um, so that would be the takeaway that I got, but uh, Paul is a lot smarter than me, so I and thinking about it, raising a couple of young children and trying to be unified uh, with Vivian on how we raise them. Any other ideas on if we refuse to be intimidated by our opponents, what will be the result um, for our opponents? Oh, well, yep, yeah, spreading the gospel. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Um, so here, at the, the summary of uh, what I would say is, if I break this down, Paul is kind of giving us um, two big pieces of advice. Um, number one, be unified. And number two, don't be afraid. Um, so as we kind of take those um, two summaries, we are going to get further into um, how are, do you become unified? What does unity look like? So Paul is going to start talking about what does unity look like, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. So the first thing that I notice when reading this passage is all of these statements start with if. So I guess the question that I have for the group is Paul expressing any kind of doubt? Is he expressing doubt when he's saying if there's any encouragement, if there's any love, if there's any fellowship? Is he expressing doubt? And if the answer is no, then what is he saying? All right, rhetorical question. All right, yeah, it's more of a, okay, yeah, I like that. It's not, it's not doubt, it's more of a rhetorical question. Okay, thanks.
Sister's FaceTiming me. Should probably turn off my ring. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other ideas of why Paul would start with if? Yeah, so it's, um, it's self-reflection on whoever is receiving the message. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. So um, I thought it was pretty confusing um, when I looked at the word if. The Greek scholars have said that that word is technically since. So it, it technically could be translated. Since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is consolation in love, since there is fellowship in the spirit, since there's affection and compassion. Um, and so there was, um, but that was another interpretation. The word is kind of up in the air. So that was kind of different ideas of why he would phrase it this way or how they would interpret it, kind of going back to Zach's point. Um, but if you read it um, in that aspect, since there's encouragement in Christ, be of the same mind. Since there is Consolation and love maintain this same love. Since there is fellowship in spirit, be united in spirit. And since there is affection and compassion in Christ, be intent on one purpose. So when uh, I think about it like that, it makes way more sense to me because it's not doubtful. It's more statements of fact and um, kind of giving you, uh, we know that all of those things are statements uh, are, are true um, and so those are kind of the the reaction to those those positive statements so paul here paul here doesn't say we should bring our thinking in line with each other what instead is to be the center around which christians unite so paul doesn't say we should bring our thinking in line with each other instead he is calling us to unite around something or someone so what is that what is paul calling us to unite around christ yeah it's all about christ it's not change your thinking because you'll be happier you should get your thinking to be more in line with mine that's not what it's about it's about since you are united with christ be together it's christ is the one who is bringing us together and uniting us So the church at Philippi was theologically sound. They were devoted, moral, loving. They were zealous. They were courageous. They were prayerful and generous. Yet it faced the danger of discord that is often generated by only a few people. Some troublemakers can stir up the contention and strife that fractures an entire congregation. And because disunity is so debilitating, Paul gently but firmly pleads with the believers to be diligent in guarding against, uh, guarding against it. So here at the end of chapter 1, Paul tells us unity, um, if we're unified, we can use that as a weapon against our opponents. At the beginning of chapter 2, he is telling us what unity looks like. It's being of the same mind, of the same love, of, this, of one accord, um, and of the same purpose. Um, and now, as we move to the next couple of verses, Paul will give us some homework of how to do it. Starting in verse 3 through 4. 
this is going to be, in my opinion, how do we get to be um, unified? So the first section was, this is why it's important. The second section of was, this is what it's going to look like. And then this section, in my opinion, is this is how you're going to go about doing those things. So do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So here he's um, starting to tell us what we need to do at an individual level to um, help ourselves become more unified with each other. What are some subtle ways selfishness is manifested in the church today? So what are some subtle ways that selfishness is manifested in the church today? Any examples of how uh, selfishness could be manifested in the church today? Um, so I guess let's think outside of Eastland. Um, in your all's experience, have you seen selfishness separate a church? And what does that look like? And did it start with, out of the gate, 50% of the people were divided on one topic? Or did it start with one person? Um, so that is, um, so yeah, just did, in your, in your mind, did COVID, um, yeah, it's, it's a good can of worms. We should really open that up. I bet we'd love that. <laughs> Pam. Yeah, all right, just leadership decisions. Okay, really good example. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I 
don't think anyone starts an argument thinking, I'm definitely wrong about this topic, but I'm going to, going to go for it anyways. It's uh, any type of disagreement, both people think that they are going to be right about whatever the topic is. So, um, yeah, I think just listening to whatever the other um, person has to say and really having empathy for their point of view. Thank you. I thought I saw a hand from this section. So if not, I'm going to start calling on people. All right. Zach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other examples? Um, subtle ways selfishness is manifested in the church today or examples of selfishness that you've seen in the church? Um, and mostly it's not to uh, beat other people down, but to be mindful of, you know, I saw this happen once and it didn't start as a huge fight. It started with a little disagreement about a number of topics and it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. Um, so repeat that last sentence for me. Okay. Yep, so if you are of one mind, you are by default unselfish. My brain's working backwards tonight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good elders would say, um, no matter how good the decision is, there's always gonna be people that disagree with it. And I think for me, always from a selfish standpoint or selfless standpoint saying, it's okay if I disagree with the decision, my job is to be a sheep and my job is to follow the shepherd. Um, and so that's the part that I think, um, yeah, I would agree with you. It's good elders really, really help. Um, but from a personal aspect, that's one thing that I've been trying to work on is I'm a sheep. And it's hard to uh, let that really sink in when you want to make the decisions. Yeah. 
We're just like selling everything. Anything that's mine is yours. Thank you. So how can we lovingly, uh, how can we work lovingly to overcome tensions like these amongst ourselves? Are there any tips or tricks um, that anyone in the group has? How can we work lovingly to overcome tensions like these amongst ourselves? Thank you. That's really good. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, just uh, approaching the situation with love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so stay stay focused. Keep working. Keep keep working at it. Um, thank you. Any other practical um, tips that we can use to um, work lovingly to overcome tensions like these amongst ourselves? Um, so, what are some practical ways to regard others as more important than you are? So uh, what are some practical ways to regard others as more important than yourself? So some of the things that I had written down um, was take time, take time to think about their side. Take time to think about their side. Um, Take time to pray on their behalf. Take time to see it from their perspective. Um, And then from a mindfulness aspect, Um, I'm not going to think about how I feel. I'm going to think about how I think they feel. I'm not going to think about how I feel. I'm going to think about um, how I think they are feeling. So, for example, at work, if tensions arise, um, I have a hard time of letting that go by the time I get home. Like, if I have a bad day, I think about how that has made me feel, like whatever tension it was, from the time I get home to the time I go to bed, I am always thinking about, that person did that to me, and it made me mad. My emotions are really simple. So, uh, but it's always like, everything is about me. I spend all of the time, the tension at work, me and a coworker collided, and we got into a disagreement, and I'm right, no, he's right, I'm right, no, he's right, and then we both leave upset, and then I go home, and I'm just, like, stewing over, uh, I can't, like, I'm so upset about that argument or whatever. But I spend all of my time thinking about how I feel. I think inside the church, that isn't helpful, because it's just emotions that are, um, continue to grow and fester. But if I reverse it and say, how are they feeling? Um, it just takes a lot of the selfishness, in my opinion, away from how I feel and just trying to think, take time to think about how it makes them feel. So that has been um, helpful for me. And then also just setting aside time to pray for them. So usually when tensions are arising and you're frustrated, it's really hard to say like, 
what I really want to do right now is pray for the person that made me frustrated. But once you do it a couple of times, it, there's just like a relaxing emotion that goes through you of that is a calming effect to just let it go. Um, and so those things have been helpful for me just to reset a mindset. Um, and so if you all have any other suggestions, I'm open for it because I think uh, for a group to learn how to release the tension amongst ourselves is, is helpful and practical. Ah, thank you. That's really helpful. Five. Nick, were you uh, trying to tell Heather, don't tell us about the time you went over and cried at her, at her house? Um, okay, so um, how can you look after someone else's best interest this week? How can you look after someone else's best interest this week? Any other tips or tricks? Yeah, so um, just your actions are 100% motivated by love. <laughs> of duty. Um, all right, so um, in, in my opinion, Paul uh, also shows us um, a good example of how, how we can show humility in chapter 1. Um, and really, I'm thinking about in Philippians chapter uh, 1, verses 21 through 24, when he's really talking about, you know, my desire. Like, is it, my desire is technically to go to heaven, but it would be better for me, uh, for your sake, if I stay here on earth. And to me, that is a really good example of how you go about doing that. So, um, um, so when I think internally about myself, so I'll try to explain what I mean. Um, do I want to die? Do I want to die? 
If I am 100% honest when I ask myself the question, the answer is no. No, I do not want to die. Why do you feel that way, Derek? Well, the reason behind my feeling, I want to uh, grow old with my wife. I want to raise my kids. Um, my kids need me. I want to see my kids get married. I want to be a grandfather. And so when I ask myself, do I want to die? And the answer is no. And the reasons behind my answer are all about me and about me doing more things. But Paul's example, that's not what Paul's example is. Paul's example, do you want to die? No. Why do you feel that way? Well, the reasons behind my feelings, this is Paul, the Philippian church needs me and I need to help them get to heaven. Uh, the reasons behind his feelings are spiritual in nature. Um, and the reasons behind my feelings weren't. Um, so for me, introspection, uh, the reasons behind my feelings, are they spiritual or physical? Um, and really, even if it's not selfish, it might just not be spiritual. So when I'm thinking about it, what better, uh, you know, if I think about my reasons for not wanting to die, do you want to die? No. What are the reasons behind my feelings? I want my kids to get to heaven. My kids need me to teach them how to get to heaven. My wife needs a partner to help her get to heaven, to help me get to heaven. I think that's what Paul's example is telling us or showing us is even though the root nature might not be uh, sinful, if you think about it from a spiritual aspect and change the reasons behind your feelings, it could be a lot more powerful. So when I started thinking about, you know, it's less about me, right, like watching my kids, like raising my kids. But if my goal is, I don't want to die because I want to get my kids to heaven, it changes my perspective on why it's important to be on this earth. Um, so that has been something that I've been um, thinking about. I just wanted to share with you, and it's okay if you think it's lame. Um, all right, moving on to, uh, well, any other comments or suggestions or thoughts before we move on to verse 5? Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So here, um, you know, Paul starts off talking about why is unity important. Then he kind of t shows us this is what unity is going to look like. Then he kind of gives us some homework of these are, this is what you do to get to unity. And now he's kind of getting into, well, why? Why should we do those things? And really, it's because Christ Jesus had that attitude in himself first. Um, although uh, Christ Jesus existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. I think the bell rang while I'm up here chatting and FaceTiming. So I appreciate everybody's comments and um, uh, participation tonight. We'll pick up in verse 5 next week. Thanks.